Father, that you will go forth today with power and understanding, demonstration, and anointing. And use us, God, to serve this generation with this word and direct us in our assignment. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us say amen. Amen. John chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 1 from the New Living Translation. And it reads, after this, Jesus crossed over the far side of the Sea of Galilee, oh, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went mm. because they saw his miracles, uh, excuse me, because they saw his miraculous yes. signs as he healed the sick. Yes. The huge crowds followed him as they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Verse 3, then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. Mm. It was near. Uh, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover festival. That might be significant. Verse five. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, "Where can we buy bread to feed all these people?" He was testing Philip. Everyone say he was testing Philip. He was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. If you don't know by now, this is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. I don't want to continue reading. I've already stopped where I want to take my text from. But if we can look at verse 5 once again. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Now, the Bible doesn't say here that they were coming because they were hungry. Right. The crowd was coming to him as he was teaching. Jesus already knew what was on their minds, but he also knew what he had to teach that day. So he knew that it's going to be a minute. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So this wasn't no 11 to 1 thing. Ah, that's good. It, it, it wasn't no 7.30 to 8.30 thing. Mm -hmm. Amen. No noonday prayer thing. Mm -hmm. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, verse 6 says. He was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. Would you please recite that with me where it says, for he already knew. Can we all recite that loud, bold, and together? Let's say that now. For he already knew what he was going to do. Let's try it like you really can read now. Ready? Let's go. For he already knew what he was going to do. And that's all I want to talk about tonight. Look at your neighbor and say, he knows what he's going to do. He knows what he's doing. That's one thing we don't have to question God about is what he's doing. Amen. God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's going to do, but it is not a thing we have to think every time something comes up. We're the ones that have to recalibrate. We're the ones that got to take a step back, get our thoughts together, draw back from the action so we can, that's what the word retreat is all about. We have to leave the battle and, and re-strategize, rethink, replan, regroup. But Jesus goes right into a scene of people coming and decides to give a test. Ah. Come on. Not a plan. He decides to give a test. I'm wondering if what this, if the circumstance you're dealing with right now, and you're looking for a way out and a word from the Lord, ah. I'm wondering is God really letting questions come up? Not so that you can see how wise God is, but so that God can see how much you will depend on him. Look at what it says. Turning to Philip, not Peter, not James, not, not the inner circle, but he turns to one who evidently has been dealing with some stuff and needs to know Jesus beyond the parables. Oh, oh that needs to know Jesus beyond the miracles, signs, and the wonders because that's why the crowd was following. Perhaps Philip was saying, he's over here, y'all, come on. And he says to Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? Verse 6 pointly says, he was testing Philip, 
for he already knew what he was going to do. He knows what he's doing. Say it again. He knows what he's doing. So when you're going through something this week and somebody say, how you going to make Listen, all I know is God knows what he's doing. You know, I don't know why I'm going through this, but God knows what he's doing. Because I'm still in his hands. Let me try to preach this thing right today. Understand that a test is a challenge or a negative circumstance that God allows. Amen. A Amen. test. I want to say a test. A test, a test is a challenge. challenge. Mm -hmm. That means if it's a challenge, that means it's coming against your strength, mm -hmm. not on. your weakness. It's coming against what you're good at and not what you're bad at. Come on. A test is a challenge. Whenever you take the test, it's already presupposed that you know the information. Yes, sir. Oh, come on in here. So only in the black, only in church have we taken tests as a negative thing. Oh, my trial and tribulation. First of all, the church hasn't gone through tribulation yet. We're going through trials, but as the body of Christ, we have not touched or reached the epic of tribulation that, that the world has yet to experience. But a test is a challenge or a, or a negative circumstance that God allows for one or two reasons. One is to develop you spiritually, make you better, make you stronger, or to show you where you are spiritually. Which means you will find out through what you're going through if you're all that you said in your testimony. Yes, sir. You will find out where your commitment is through the test. Oh my God. You will find out where your faith is in the test. And the truth be told, I know everyone's writing notes or reading or whatever you're doing, but if, if I can just see faces for a minute, uh, and we can all understand that with the test, God is saying it's all right for you to go through this because if you know me, you already know I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And if you know me the way you testified, then all you have to do, even if this time take you by surprise, just remember the last time who I was and what I did for you. Somebody shout right there and say, I'm confident that God knows what he's doing. We have to ask ourselves, do we look at circumstances or do we look to Jesus? Amen. Do we look at the problem or do we look at the Savior? Uh huh. We have to ask ourselves, do, do we feel of the pressure of the circumstance and complain to God? Uh huh. Oh, you didn't hear that. Do we feel the pressure of the circumstance? Yeah. I don't know what that y'all know we we all been there. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know how we're gonna do it and this, that, and the other. I had a bill and, and I read it and I tucked it away and uh, I didn't put it hide it, I just put it away. And Pastor saw it and, and she said to me, you know, uh, we don't have to worry about that no more. Y'all can get all the burden that lifted yeah. off of me that quick. Yeah. <laughs> You know, she said, oh, yeah, you don't have to worry about that because of this. And when she began to explain to me, I said, impossible. She said, no, there's enough money there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And it really, pers it's a personal matter. Amen. It really dealt with one of our investments. So she said, you don't have to keep paying into that because it has reached a maturity that the money keeps making money. Amen. 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 And then I'm like, no, wait a minute. Money makes money by you putting money there. She said, but it's reached the maturity. Yes. It's reached a point where it, you don't have to keep putting it there. It keeps, it keeps paying for itself. Do you feel the pressure of the circumstance or uh, do you complain to God? So I'm already like, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this. I mean, it's right here at Christmas. I'm going to put that kind of money there, this, that, and the other. And it was already done. It was already handled. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. There's the things I don't have to worry about when it matures. When it matures, when it matures you don't have to stress. You let it do the work. Where before you had the work to prove. Yes, God. Oh, my God. The other thing we have to look at is do we give God what we have and let him work it out or allow him to provide for us? Oh, come on. We're still failing. We're still failing. Because do we really give him what we have in this? And now, Lord, you take it and provide. No, we don't do that. We take what we have. Yes, somebody give me some money right quick. You know preachers don't have money. Give me something right quick. Just, just throw something in my hand. Amen. Uh, 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 there you go. Thank you, sir. And then, you know, we're, we're, as long as I have this $20 bill in my pocket, 
I'm good. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. I'm good because, uh, see, it's only 20, so I'm not going to give an offering because I only got 20. <laughs> And I have to eat. So, you know, and then I might have to go to church this afternoon. So I might have to pay toll or something. I don't know, but, but we probably will stop and get a burger afterwards. You know, so I'm not going to give anything because I got 20. But I got more confidence in this 20 than I have the fact that if I place it in the master's hand, he can take 20 and multiply. As long as it's in my hand, it remains 20. But when I place it in God's hand, 20 multiplies. Good God Almighty in here. I'm only talking to people that's not afraid to give. People that's, that doesn't worship money above your faith in God. Do I have let me take because I need 20? Keep preaching about that 20 like it is mine. All right, do we understand this? But we have to understand that, and I wish I had time. I'm just going to give you scriptures, and I want you to write them down. Don't be surprised if I come on a Wednesday and we revisit this so we can go through the scripture. But God allows circumstances. One, he allows us so to see what is in our heart. And if we'll remain faithful to him. Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3. Some of you preachers should already know that one. Deuteronomy, just write D-E-U-T period. <laughs> All right. Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3. He allows us to, he says, I allowed you to go these years in the wilderness so that I could prove you and to try you and to see what's in your heart. Stop believing the Christians that tell you you did something wrong and God is punishing you. Stop saying God, and listen to people telling you God is catching up to you. Stop giving credit to the devil. The devil look like he stuck this one on God. Don't do that to yourself. God is in control of everything that happens in your life, good and bad. Yes. And even the bad things didn't kill you. That's why you're here listening to me say it. Which is your proof positive that God is in control. And the fact that you can refer to it as a past experience yes. and not a current tribulation. Oh, y'all don't hear this. So God allows circumstances to see what is in our heart. Number two, he allows circumstances in Psalm 107 and 6. He allows, I'm not going to repeat it, play it on YouTube. He allows circumstances, number two, to draw us closer to himself. Do you get that? Number three, Psalm 119 and 71. He allows circumstances to draw us closer to his word. You come on, somebody tell the truth. You don't really pray until you're going through. That's right. When you're not going through, you absent from church. When you're not going through, you got you're too busy. You got too much to do. But when you're going through, can I get a ride? Can, we, can, we, we have a church Friday. Uh, why, why we gotta leave now? I, I'm just not feeling this. See, when you're going through, you want to prove God in the day. You will, you will feel that your one hallelujah is supposed to make heaven back up and stop. You think your one wave of the hand or your, the first time you gave in six months, you think that's supposed to bring the miracle. Right. It doesn't work that way because God is a God of principle. Y'all yeah. don't hear this. And number four, it is used in Hebrews 5 and 8. It is used to teach us obedience. Yes, yes. If you didn't get the scriptures, please go to our channel. This is what we have to understand when we deal with circumstances. We have to look to God and not look at the problem. Why look to God? Because God knows what he's doing. Yes. Uh, you, maybe the, you lost excitement, but that topic alone is thrilling yes. my spirit. It is keeping me in confidence and comfort in knowing I don't have the answers. Yes. I don't know the way out. Yes. I don't know what God wants I to do don't. next. But one thing I do know, don't. God knows what he's doing. Sure. And that's why I shout the way yes. I do. That's why I sing and keep pressing my way. Because one thing, I don't know what God is going to do next. I don't know how he's going to do it next. I don't know when he's going to do it. But I know he knows what he's doing. And if he knows what he's doing, he, he said in the book of Isaiah, he don't have to take counsel with nobody. God, oh, I wish I had some church folks hollering back at me. God does have to check with the apostles and the prophets. This should I do it this way? He doesn't have to check with the heavenly host to see if he's going to do it another way. He doesn't even seek permission from hell to give him an advance notice. Is it all right if I come and invade? God is God. And beside 
whom there is no other. Somebody clap your hands and holler. And if you know that he knows what he's doing, make some noise in this place. See, I understand. We don't know what we're doing, but he knows. We don't have the answers, but he does. So, so we operate in fear, but he waits on faith. We panic, but he produces. We complain, but he's content. We dumb down, but he demonstrates. We get bewildered, but he is, but he doesn't just because. We don't know what to do, but he knows at all times what he's doing. Somebody better holler, I got your preacher. I got you. That was a wrong. He was ready for 25 more. Hallelujah. But here's the thing you got to understand as I move to my second point. God, God has a perfect plan. Tell your neighbor, say, God doesn't just have a plan. God has a perfect plan. That means when there's a perfect plan of God, there's no failure in God. When there's a perfect plan of God, that means it's a flawless plan of God. Go ahead, go and preach. When God has a perfect plan, you don't have to look for anything to be wrong with it. Because it's not just a plan. You and I have plans. But God has perfect plans. Somebody say the master plan. The master plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The perfect plan is the master's master plan. Uh huh. And this is what God does. If you look at here, at the feeding of the 5,000, God uses the unknown in order to make divine impact. My God. Whoa. Whoa. My God. Whoa. He uses the unknown. And, and when Jesus asked Philip and the disciples, uh, what, how are we going to feed these people? Uh, the, the, the result was one of the disciples found a young man, a young boy. And they said, here's a young boy with his lunch. Two fish mm -hmm. and five loaves of bread. Now don't think the loaves of bread that we had with so many slices. They were just cakes. Yeah. All right? And all he had was find out two fish and five cakes of bread. That's enough to make a fish sandwich. Mm -hmm. It's something to keep him while he's there and enough bread to munch on while he goes home. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. It was just a one individual's meal. Yes. Perhaps a lunch, not even a snack, but a lunch. But Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Now, that's what the scripture said, didn't it? It said in verse 6, for he knew what he was going to do. It did not say he knew who he was going to use. Wow, wow. Now y'all quiet. Come on, come on. Jesus knew that somebody out of 5,000 men, not including women and children, had to have something. Yes, yes. And if not that, yeah. He will feed everybody from nothing. Yeah. Yes. 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 What's the real miracle here? I think we missed the real miracle. I don't think the real miracle is that two fish and five loaves of bread fed over 5,000 people. And according to the scripture, because this miracle of Jesus is the only one recorded in all four of the gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one talks about the feeding of the 5,000. And if you read two more chapters later, you will find out in one of the Gospels that then he, the same opportunity came up again where he fed 4,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Already preached from these things. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing I want you to see. We are taught through the theologians that this is a miracle. But I'm wondering, do we miss the greatest miracle? Yeah. Because if no one had anything, he already knew what he was going to do. Oh my God. Y'all missing this. I, I need the right folks here. Here's what you're missing. This boy robbed Jesus of the divine miracle of creating something out of nothing. Because he had something that Jesus could use. You're saying I'm down to nothing, but the, but you really need a Philip in your life to say, well, what you got there in that brown paper bag? Right, right. Come on. What you got there in that lunch pail? You got something that y'all just missed. You got $20. Yeah, yeah. 
That God can say, I can take 20. Okay, y'all don't like this. The, the Bible doesn't use the word flipping. <laughs> but somebody listening, because in here they deep, they got saved and deep. But somebody listening to us on YouTube understand what flipping is. God can take it, and, and in the street we flip it. But God can take your odds and your chances. And this is not an endorsement for gambling. But he can take the little you have and take the little and make it much. Yeah. If you don't believe me, how are you still eating? Say it. You don't believe that how you still have a roof over your head. Yeah. You don't believe that how you still functioning. Yeah. It's because you have not, I, but I don't have enough, but you have enough for God to work yeah. with. Oh my God. Yeah. Look at somebody say, you're not enough. Yeah. It's just enough yeah. for God to work with. To work oh, with. I wish somebody was ready to shout right there. What you don't have enough of is just the right amount for God to work with. Because if you had all that you need, you would not need God. If you had all that you need, you would have no need for God. And God is not getting glory out of anyone staying in poverty. No, he's not. Y'all not, not talking back now. He's not getting glory. See, I'm really God because they poor. No, no, no. That's not the case. But you know him right now as your provider. Right now you know God as he's going to do it. But not many days from hence you're going to know him as he did it. Oh, somebody should have shouted right there. You better get ready. Somebody should have shouted. Because right now, I know him as he's going to do it. But there's coming a day and it won't be long. Because there's got to be nothing but favor on our lives for the remainder of this year. As we close out, I've been reading and hearing too many prophetic utterances that the remaining days of this year, we want to be overwhelmed with God's favor. The blow, it just means that God is gonna He's gonna keep the lights on. Yes. He's gonna keep the food in the house. Yes. He's gonna keep the body healed. Yes. He's gonna keep your mind strong. Yes. Say God is moving me is moving from me. knowing Him from knowing as him. He's going to do it. Going to, do it. to He has done it. with God, you cannot allow small-minded people yes. to make you miss your miracle. Yes. Yes. Don't, yes. don't allow small minds to make you miss minds, miss miracle, mind, miss miracle, mind, miss miracle. Don't allow small minds to make you miss your miracle. God is going to do because he already knew the circumstance when you were still doing well. He knew storms that were coming when you still were in clear skies. He knew bad days were coming when every day with you was good. And it was unbelievable. And the bad day took you off guard because you got so comfortable to the good times that you forgot that behind good times come bad times. And behind bad times come good times. It's nothing but a cycle. But God is still constant. It's just like the parent. God is trying to get us to see that he is the father. He is the ultimate parent. And you parents that in here know what, know what I'm saying when I say it. A parent, will, this is where the young people can put your fingers in your ear. This is where uh, the parent will use reverse psychology yeah. <laughs> on their child. The child will come asking a question and the parent will ask answer their question with the question. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Why is the purpose of reverse psychology? It is for the child to come up with the answer. Yes. Come on. Yes. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. Come on. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm stepping into something. Somebody better help me. So you mean to tell me in the church I'm always being preached to that God is going to do this and God is going to do that and God is going to fix what I broke and God's going to repair what I messed up and God's going to restore what I fell from. It's always God and God and God. But then God puts responsibility on me so that I can learn that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world so that I can learn that answer for my situation is already in me because the word have I hid in my heart. In my heart. looking at everything else but me. Watch this. Reverse psychology. The parent uses it on the child not to punish but to get the child to recognize. Yeah. 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 
that the answer was in you all the time. All the time. All the time. Just tell somebody, honey, just do what you know. Come on, tell like you mean to say, just do what you already know. Oh my God. Because whenever God, give me that 20 again, please. The illustration not over. Hallelujah. Here's the thing, way God works, that whatever it is that you think you have the least stuff, yeah. Yeah. But every $20 right now for me is a lot. Uh -huh. This means I can eat. Amen. <laughs> this tells me I can eat. I can go to Burger King or I can go to, yeah. what's the place called? Yeah. McDonald's, all right. Uh, or I can go down here to the Jamaican place. Right. Or I can go to Empire. Mm -hmm. I can get me a meal with, soup, with here mm -hmm. with $20. I can get soup <laughs> or salad. Yeah. And the full entree yeah. and beverage yeah. and bread. <laughs> and if I pick the right thing uh, and dessert. I think what they call the complete meal. They only mean it's complete. Then I also get dessert. It may be a spoonful or a cupful. <laughs> but it's still in the in the $20. Yeah. But I really might need not to eat, but I really might need 200 in order to pay my phone bill. Uh -huh. I might need 2000 to pay my expenses for the month. Right, 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 right. Come on. And my prophesying says, so that's the number right. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> He's a prophet. I told somebody the other day, sir, I, I told Friday night at that Holy Temple, I said in John chapter 5, I'm going to quote this, sir, I perceive that you are. I'll tell you about that story when we're off camera. It involves somebody in Florida. <laughs> okay. Now watch this. Watch this. The 20 is small. It's not enough to pay my monthly expenses. But it's enough for me to eat today. However, this 20 is only as good as it can be. Depending. Get ready. Depending on whose hands it's in. Yes, sir. Ah! Come on. Come on. Yes. Okay, you don't see it. Let, I, 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 I was hoping you would. No, no, you don't see it because I need to go somewhere. I don't want you to get it yet. Get it in one more minute. Here's what you need to understand. To me, to me, a slingshot is nothing but a toy. But today, it was, a weapon. it was a mighty weapon to bring down a giant. It depends on whose hand it's in. To me, a rod is just a stick. But to Moses, it was a tool to divide the Red Sea. Say with me, it depends.
Because the God I serve, he already knows what he's going to do. You can tell your neighbor it's already a done deal. I'm gonna close with this. I'm gonna close with this. The Bible says, there you go. Put a date on that thing. See, that's the real faith. See, the real faith isn't just hallelujah. The real faith is this week. I'm sorry y'all couldn't hear that at home. But people in here going off declaring and decreeing that this is their word, this is their tool, this word is their weapon. And I'm not accepting the lack and not another day. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. My final point. My final point is, and I gave you three of you, two already if you missed them. But the final point is, it's time to use your leftovers. It's time to use your leftovers. You need to lean on somebody and say, honey, you're about to be so blessed. See, I'm not doing it. When you do it at home, lean on somebody, get somebody in that room and tell them, neighbor, you're about to be so supernaturally blessed that you're going to have more than what you asked for. You're going to have more than what you need. You're going to have so much more that you that used to beg, you're now going to be the lender and not the borrower. The head and not the tail. You're gonna be the provider and not the seeker. If I have a witness, say yes. Unemployed people are still providing for me. They're still doing things for my life. And you can't tell me that you don't sow into the prophet of God and not reap the prophet's reward. Y'all not screaming in here like you believe it. But somebody at home scream like you believe it. Scream because God is telling you, start living off your leftovers. Start using your leftovers. Because the Bible teaches us that when Jesus multiplied the two fish and five loaves of bread, that the disciples came back to him and said, everybody is eating. Everyone is licking their fingers and wiping their mouths. And we have 12 basket full leftovers. That's the prop department. Y'all should have came up with the basket. We still have 12 baskets full and they're left over. Understand that nothing is too little for God to use. Nothing is too little for God to use. Y'all don't hear it. Nothing is too little for God to use. How many fish were there? Two. Two. Thank you, baby. Two fish. How many loaves of bread were there? Five. Five. Two fish. Five loaves of bread. Who in here is good at math? <laughs> Sir, I want you to answer nice and loud. You're on camera. Two fish. Two and five loaves of bread. How much is that? How much? Okay, thank you. Two fish and five loaves of bread. Two plus five equals seven. Do you get that? Two plus the five equals how much? Seven. Two plus the five equals what? See, y'all still there. You got it. We left that. Two. I'm sorry at home, but I'm dealing with two. Two plus five equals what? And it's not ringing the bell with you yet. Two. See, two isn't significant. Five is not enough. But when you put it together, yes, God. Yes, God. I'm telling you right now, this boy with his lunch messed up a greater miracle. Because what were they going to eat when they had absolutely nothing? But the boy showed up with two and five. And when Jesus saw his own, he didn't see two and five. He saw seven. Y'all missing this. Seven with God is the number of completion. Come on. So now Jesus is provoked by the amount of what seemed not enough. Over the fact 
He already knew he was going to provide. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all not getting this. There was no difference in the Lord providing for 5,000 men, mm -hmm. not including women and children, mm -hmm. than what he did some centuries earlier when Israel was in the wilderness and said, we don't have nothing to eat. Mm -hmm. And twice that happened, and twice God did something. One time, he said, he sent manna from heaven. We still to this day don't really know what manna is. The Hebrews called it angels food or angel bread because it came from heaven. So it was manna. Then when they got tired of eating, and God says, you will get this every day. So here's the, old, the, the seniors. You know, we go shopping, but the seniors will go to the market every day because they want the fresh vegetables. They want the fresh. Y'all missing this thing. We will stock up for the month. That showed you what we're buying. <laughs> Canned food and all of that stuff. But I remember I used to go walk with my grandfather every day after work because he cooked for my grandmother. And every day after work, we I walked with him to the supermarket. Why? Because I wanted a little plastic toy or something that you could also get. Because he went to the market, then he went to the drugstore in the corner, got the paper and all of that stuff. That's where the toys were in the drugstore. Now that's just in our neighborhood. So I walked with him. I couldn't wait for my grandfather to come home because I get a chance to go to the store. And don't you know that thing followed me all the way until I was going to college? My grandfather would help my mother and my sister and I out. And uh, every other Saturday would come to my mother's house, pick me up, and take me to the supermarket to buy groceries for our house. Y'all don't get it. So we come down to me getting blessed. The Lord's been providing all of my life. In ways I didn't recognize as a blessing. What kid wants to get up early on it? You know old folks get up early. I don't want to get up early on a Saturday. But I was able to, but I had to. Because he wasn't carrying the bags in the house. I had to do that. Yeah, you the, you the boy in the house, so you got to do some work. Yeah, right. But I had to go. We had to pay for none of the meat, none of the milk, none of the cereal, none of the ice cream, none of the bread, none of the vegetables, nothing. My grandfather provided for us. Yes. You're missing this thing. Jesus saw the two and the five, and he didn't see a lack. He saw completion. He said, oh, I have to get in this. Oh, I was talking about the man. We'll talk about that later. But the man of God says, y'all, I'll give it to you every day. He said, don't save it, don't store it up because it'll go bad and you'll have other problems. But every morning you wake up, there'll be fresh manna. Then the people said, we're tired of manna. He said, okay, you want some meat? And then he allowed quails to fly low enough that all the people had to do was just reach up and grab it out the air. And they had meat. You don't understand. Look at your neighbor and say, honey, it wasn't manna or quails. But I'm a witness God provide daily for my house. Somebody should be shouting right there. God will take your incomplete and make it complete. Somebody better, you better knock somebody over and praise the God right there. Never let your circumstances predetermine the outcome.